welcome to episode 218 of School Librarians United. I'm your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian in my 16th year, I knew I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that all the ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast by myself, my interview guests, and listeners who reach out to the podcast are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. When incorporating research, I always make sure to cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast has something for you. I'd like to extend a very special welcome this week to Min, Michelle, and especially to Alfie. You inspire me every day. And to listeners, Joe in New Zealand, Lisa in California, Courtney in Nebraska, Kim in New Hampshire, Christy in North Carolina, Lisa in Ohio, Debbie in Oregon, and Shannon in Vermont. Katie in Oklahoma was very kind to write the podcast, and I asked if I could share this letter with you today. Katie wrote... I just wanted to say thank you for your wonderful podcast and all the valuable information I have learned through it while listening for the last two years. I decided to pursue school librarianship as a second career after spending the last eight years as a stay-at-home mom with my three kids. After years of volunteering in the library, I fell in love with the work and started grad school last fall. I have binged so many episodes of your podcast trying to learn all the ins and outs of this career and have notebooks full of notes and ideas. Today, I accepted my first job as an elementary school librarian, and I feel so honored and lucky to be a part of this profession. Thank you so much for all the work you put into the podcast. I feel like it's given me a real life picture of what it's like to be a librarian and equipped me to excel. I know I still have so much to learn, so I'll remain a loyal listener. Keep up the good work. And I will always tell you, you know, I like to share these, these messages and well wishes from listeners not only because it affirms all of the work that goes into making a weekly podcast, but but more importantly, remember that all of these episodes were done with amazingly talented and generous guests who come on the show each week and share their expertise and their resources. And I couldn't do this without you. And I will say this again, that as long as there are amazing people out there who are interested on being on the show and sharing what they know with listeners around the world, I am committed to broadcasting an episode each and every week. Friends, I welcome you and all listeners to reach out with your feedback and episode suggestions. You can reach me either on Facebook, on Twitter, my handle is at LMS underscore United, or the email address schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include your mailing address, I'll be sure to send you a podcast sticker. And now for a word from our official sponsor, Capstone. Capstone is an innovative publisher and education technology provider of children's content for school libraries, classrooms, and at-home learning. Home of the award-winning Pebble Go Research Database, Capstone has a passion for creating inspired learning and intellectual curiosity in children, and I am so excited to be working with them. And now in a segment I like to call Why I Love Capstone. Friends, in keeping with last week's theme of science in our collection, I really like the idea of featuring books which will not only demonstrate to our science teachers this commitment that we have to provide relevant content and and build out the collection to support what they're doing in their classrooms, but also to make sure that if you have a makerspace or a STEAM or STEM space in your library, that these are some wonderful and and very sort of low tech and in some cases low cost uh, opportunities that you can include in your library programming. And in this case, we've got, uh, it is a series called Recycled Science. And it is a series actually which first came out in 2017, but is incredibly relevant, especially when we have, uh, you know, we have Earth Day and we are celebrating how we can uh, shape our lessons to support recycling and responsible use of the resources we have with our students. So in this case, we have Amazing Cardboard Tube Science, 
awesome craft stick science, cool plastic bottle and milk jug science, and finally, incredible snack package science. And so I I really like this concept because it sounds like in every single case, so much of what is needed can easily be uh, requested and put out in that like PTO newsletter. You can send out a blast to your families and say, hey, you know, we're going to be doing some of these, uh, you know, earth-friendly projects in the learning commons or in your library. But in this case, I want to read from the uh, description on the website. What's better than learning and having fun at the same time? These cool science experiments and projects will have readers enjoying themselves while learning scientific principles. This hands-on approach to learning will ensure readers remember what they've learned long after the projects are done. Friends, in this case, we've got an interest level of grades three through nine, so perfect for your middle grade collection. These books average 32 pages, and they are retailing at this time for $22.99. I am so grateful to Capstone for their continued commitment to support the podcast in Season 5. They are offering listeners of School Librarians United a very special discount. Visit shop.capstonepub.com and use the code UNITED to get $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and Capstone interactive ebooks. That's code UNITED for $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and ebooks on shop.capstonepub.com. And now for today's episode, Supporting Trans Students and Staff, and my conversation with a school librarian in California. Friends, I'm so excited. I want to welcome an incredibly special guest to the podcast today for the purposes of their personal safety and to be able to have this conversation in a very safe space. We are going to meet G from California. G, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Amy. I am super honored to be here. You know, friends, I speak on behalf of myself and many members of our listening community, when I say, gee, thank you so much for deciding to share this very important conversation with listeners today. Yeah, Amy, thank you so much um, for having the platform to talk about it. I've really enjoyed listening to the podcast, and um, it's something that I've been thinking a lot about. Um, As somebody who is a non-binary trans person who um, works as a school librarian, this topic is super, super close um, to me as an employee, but also because um, I'm also the librarian of many trans students. And yeah, I think it's really important that we do all that we can um, to support them, especially now um, in our current climate in the U.S. and around the world. Um, it is really a, a hard time to be a trans person right now. And so I think making the space to have this conversation and talk about the tangible ways that we can support people um, is, is really important. I am very aware that the voices who have dominated this platform have been white and cis and female like myself, and your perspective and lived experience is one which is so vitally needed to enrich and help the rest of us do better in our our work as school librarians. So I'm so grateful that you're here today. Thank you, Amy. I, I really appreciate um, appreciate that. I think there's so much um, that all of us um, can do to to push and drive um, the the profession towards one that is more just and is more inclusive. Um, I, while I am um, someone who who is trans, I am also white, and something that you know is is part of my everyday practice is is anti-racism. It will, you know, it's never over. It is always going to be something um, that I wholeheartedly make sure is um, a part of my school librarianship practice and my personal life practice as well, along with fighting homophobia, fighting transphobia. All of these things are connected. All of the oppressions in our society are connected to each other. And it is, it's the imperative of, of all of us, um, in the capacities that we can to, to stand up and, and speak out in, um, the ways that we are able to. So yeah, thank you for, um, having the conversation and I look forward, you know, I think this, this might be a first for the podcast, but I definitely hope it's not the, the last. 
Oh, I am so, I, I hope that's true. I, and, and, and if there is somebody else who, who recognizes those gaps in, in our guests, um, you know, reach out to the podcast and please volunteer because so many times the, the voices on this show are people who have done just that emailed me and, and, and you know what friends, that is exactly how we are, are having this conversation today. A, an incredibly wonderful and very random email popped up and I checked my email during work, which is what you're not supposed to do. And I said, Oh my gosh. And, and, and so I'm so excited for this conversation today. Thank you so much. All the guests who've ever joined me in recording episodes are experts in their field and they share their experiences, but I feel like a topic like this is intensely personal and I want to tread very carefully. I'm hoping that if at any time during this conversation that I ask questions that are insensitive or I overstep, I I hope that you feel comfortable sort of reining me in and just make sure that you correct me because when we know better, we do better. Yeah, yeah, no, of course. I, I really appreciate that. Um, as you know, someone who does work in education, I've definitely kind of set um, boundaries for like myself with like staff and, and students of like, okay, these are questions I will answer because, you know, for many of my um, students and even for many of st- my fellow staff, I am the first um, first trans person, first non-binary person that they've ever met in their entire life. And so um, for, for me, um, that I have just um, kind of said, okay, I'm going to take this educational role. And I um, know that, you know, nobody's ever obligated um, to do that. And many trans people choose not to be in that role, but it's something that I choose to do. Um, and I do have um, boundaries for what I will and won't answer. Um, and so, so yeah, I will just let you know if something ever comes up. But, and again, thank you for um, the grace and the um, sensitivity that you're coming to the conversation with. It, it isn't your job to educate others about your own journey, but this audience is one that is incredibly receptive to, as, as our roles as lifelong learners, we want to make sure that we're doing better, not just by our students, but also by our, our fellow educators. The hope is that increasingly more and more trans educators are going to find that schools are a place where they can be their authentic selves, that they can be supported by an administration and school community, which is going to embrace them and and make sure that everybody feels safe and and supported in in the workspace. Yeah, um, I I really hope for that as well. Uh, Yeah, it's at least in my my current experience, I ha- I actually really haven't met um, that many other um, trans educators, let alone trans school librarians. There's a couple um, groups, um, and I went to um, AXA, the Association of California School Administrators. Um, and they had a Out with Pride um, conference, and I got to meet the first out trans superintendent, um, which was very very cool to to get to connect in that way. Um, but yeah, it. I'm, I'm hoping to um, kind of grow the community because I feel like the amount of trans educators that, that are out um, and who can be out um, for, for safety reasons is small. And then when you look at school librarians, that number gets even smaller. I think I maybe know one. <laughs> you are absolutely unique and special and wonderful. And that's one of the reasons why this episode is so vitally important, Um, friends. And I I know that you will join me in respecting uh, G's safety and their ability to be able to to join us for this conversation. We are going to do everything we can to uh, protect your identity. um, And and we'll talk about uh, how to reach you. If, If anybody at the end of this conversation would like to indeed get in touch with our guests, we will not be sharing any social media contacts or 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 email directly with our guest, but you can always go through me. So let's start where we always do in these conversations. G, would you give us an idea? Where in the country do you work? Tell us about your current library, the kind of programs you have, what kind of uh, schedule do you have? I, I, I'm so curious. 
Yeah. Um, so um, I work in California. Um, I am a middle school librarian. I'm at a Title I middle school. Um, there's about 750 students. This is my second year there. Um, so I am on a flexible schedule. Um, I teach media literacy activities, lessons, um, you know, covering everything from algorithm bias, source evaluation. I um, pull in um, a lot of different connections across disciplines. It's mostly um, ELA classes right now, but I'm really trying to build um, more connections. I just had a fantastic meeting with our social studies department um, and um, I'm working on science and music. This Earlier this year we did a big science research project and so I'm hoping to build some, some, pro, um, some uh, more programming in the future. Um, so um, it varies from week to week but you know it's about about 15 to 20 hours of lessons sometimes. And then in addition um, to that, I am a mentor for our TREK program, which stands for Trust, Relationships, Empowerment, and Choice. And that is a special program for students who need extra social, emotional, um, and behavior support in specifically a trauma-informed environment. So um, I mentor students um, in that program. Um, I'm also on our school site council, which um, looks at school budget and our, our school climate. I'm on our RBO team. Um, RBO is results by objective and that looks at um, school climate issues from a staff perspective and so we brainstorm how we can address climate issues um, and we look at whether it's a contractual issue or um, a climate issue and then we go from there. I'm also on our district's design team um, which is working on kind of updating our mission and vision for our school district and where we want to go. Um, and I also have a makerspace. Um, I got a grant this past year to start an art makerspace because we don't currently have a full-time art teacher. Although we, with the new legislation that was just passed, we are finally getting one. Um, so I have an art makerspace doing a reading club. I co-facilitate the GSA with our school counselors and social workers. Um, and I also have a lunchtime art space that is really popular. Um, I am also the secretary for my union. Um, and, um, other things in my library. We just did a big weeding project. I just ran the report in Destiny. Over 7,000 books that hadn't circulated in over 10 years or out of date. I'm also in the process of genrefying and dynamic sh shelving. Shout out to Kelsey Bogan. Uh, it has revolutionized my circulation. <music> things. First and foremost, you have a seat at the table. It sounds like you have made sure that you are part of the conversations that are going to drive your school, whether it's programming or it's staffing, it's climate. And the fact is you're, you already have that, seat, that, that essential seat at the table. It doesn't sound like people you will let people ignore you. It doesn't sound like you, it doesn't sound like you are uh, you're just going to fade into the woodwork and quietly go about doing your job. I'm so pleased to hear that your building has tapped the, the willingness and, and energy that you bring to them. Yeah, before I started, um, they, um, my school doesn't have certificated, um, or my district doesn't hire certificated um, teacher librarians, although I've, I've got my MLIS and my um, teaching credential. Um, they, before, uh, before my me, my predecessor um, had neither. Someone who did the book circulations, and so I came in with a with a mission to to sw switch things around. And luckily, I have a very supportive principal um, who is supportive of the programming and of my budget. I when I first started, um, I was told I had a thousand dollars for everything, and I have since then grown it quite considerably. You know, so many fantastic things are happening here. When I, I look at this just litany of all these things that you're involved in, this trek, it's trust, relationships, empowerment, choice. You know, it sounds like a great program. Are you working hand in hand with some of your student support services like counselors or social workers or school psychologists in that case? Yes. So that program, they're a self-contained classroom. So they have um, less than 10 students uh, and they have their own social worker um, and so um, and their own um, main classroom teacher. And um, typically they also have a paraprofessional in there as well. And so what I do is I work with all of them and I mentor one or two students um, once a week. They come in, um, we kind of talk about their goals and what they want to get out of it. And it's a nice, quiet space for them to just do 
work for somebody else. They help me, you know, they help me shelve, they help me with different like library programmings and it's just a calm space because for them it's a self-contained classroom and so they are with the same group of students all day and so it's an, a nice breather to kind of also get that experience of going somewhere somewhere else and a new environment and yeah. I also, um, I work with um, our counseling team. We have um, three counselors um, and a social worker um, and a school psychologist as well. And so I'll also work with them. And sometimes we're a safe space uh, for students who, you know, need a little quiet time at lunch or somewhere to be. Um, I co-facilitate um, GSA or Gender and Sexuality Alliance with them as well. And so um, we all co-facilitate and lead programmings. We're just starting a collaboration with um, a local LGBT archive, and so they'll send us archival uh, copies of archival materials. They won't send us the originals, um, and then our students will get to explore LGBT history because even though it's in our ed code that we teach LGBT history at a K-12 level, um, that is not quite translated into the classroom yet. So lots of exciting stuff. Depending on where you are in the country, the idea of having LGBTQIA studies integrated into any sort of school curriculum might might throw some people for a loop. May I ask, did the GSA exist before you got there? No. No, it did not. <laughs> <laughs> so look at you. You you are you are creating instant change just by being in this school. I have to imagine your coworkers realize the transformative power that it has when you bring number one, a certified school librarian into your space. You're gonna just that alone is going to you know that ripple effect. But then to also you know kudos to your district and to the the administrator who hired you. Because you are, and you know you are, I, I am, I, I work in a district, I have a, a, a trans educator who I work alongside with, we were hired in our same same cohort, and it has been such an opportunity for our students in who are LGBTQIA and to, to see how the district supports them as students and also the educator who has been hired and the first of, of hopefully more who will, who will join our, our, uh, our team. But this is amazing. So when you went into the school, how long did you wait before you said, we need a GSA? <laughs> um, was it day two or was it day three? <laughs> Um, I wanted to see what all what all we had. Um, it took me um, about I think like a, a month or so before I went to my principal. Um, you know, because I kind of wanted to to get a feel to meet other people, see who I could collaborate with um, as well, um, and kind of feel out the space. And about a month after, I had talked to my principal and I said, you know, I think that we need we need a GSA. Um, I think that could be a really important space for our students. And um, we started it my first year that I was there and it was pretty, um, it was pretty low key, only a few students. And then um, we were able to pull in uh, more sustained support from our counseling team and it's, and it's grown. We've got about 10 to 15 students who um, come regularly and we're hoping to expand, um, expand to next year even further. And our principal is definitely very on board, which is which is really nice. We're starting actually our first day of silence. Um, yeah, they've never we've never done day of silence before, and we've um, been the students have been working on it. They um, were using the art maker space to make posters um, this week, and those um, have completed. And so when we um, we're about to go on break, when we come back from break, um, the students will have their first ever um, day of silence action. We we did a, a day of silence at my school last year, and I think the one thing that we needed to do a better job in communicating, because it, because of the pandemic, so many of these programs, which might have happened, were put on hold. But day of silence is also an opportunity for allies to participate. And that was something where some of my students, I said, hey, do you, you know, we were handing out the, the, the tape that they were putting and the, the signs and the little, little, little card that says, I'm observing day of silence. And, you know, they were writing on themselves. And a couple of kids said, well, I'm not gay. And I'm like, oh, but that's okay. You're, you're showing your support. This is this is also for allies, and so I I think that 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 point should also be part of that when when these programs roll out. But 
I got to say, having a GSA at the middle school is not an obvious an obvious program. I, I think that at the high school, that it's you know not unusual for a high school to have a, a GSA or a diversity team, but to have one at the at the middle school, that's a win. I mean, I mean, maybe maybe you maybe you're just like, oh, of course we're going to have a GSA, but I don't know. I, I I'm I I'm going to guarantee you there are listeners right now going, oh no, that would not fly. Uh, I just. I mean, congratulations. You, you've landed well. Do you feel like you've landed well? <laughs> yes. I, like, I feel so, so fortunate to have such a supportive principal. I know that she has my, she's had my back in numerous um, instances advocating. She, she really advocates for the library, for GSA, for making our school a safe place for our students. And so, yes, I feel very fortunate because, yeah, for many places around the country, even getting a high school GSA uh, is is a struggle. And even though um, students articulate their gender identity and sexuality at the elementary school level, students have such an awareness of gender identity and sexuality from a very young age. Um, But if you are not in a space where it's safe to have those conversations, it can be very difficult for the students to get the support that they need. And even when I first started, there were no um, no books with LGBT characters in the library. And um, so I, I was like, let me make a book list. <laughs> um, and, you know, and not unlike many other collections, it was very white. It was very dated. Um, and I had students that were like, I never, I, this is my first time. I didn't know there were gay books. I had a kids that they were like, you can, there's a girl and she can, that's the there's two girls i was like yeah yep they're dating and they're like oh my god uh and so to just provide that representation for students and i mean i had students who are coming and they're like i cried while reading this book or they're like i'm obsessed with this book because it's touching like that part of themselves that yearns for connection and to be seen and to be able to give that opportunity to students and like facilitate that access is so powerful because um, in so many places around the country that access is being threatened, thwarted, attacked. You know, you hear all those books that are being pulled from shelves and yeah, it is, it is very scary right now. in that you are having this conversation today. We're sharing the good news that's coming out of California. And, you know, I, I'm so grateful that that you, you have stepped up because I think that it's such a vitally important voice to hear um, coming from the library, coming from a space where you can be your authentic self, you have the support of your administration, and you ha- you have seen in the short time that you've been in your school the impact that, that, that as is the school librarian, you have this ability to, to affect every kid in that school through the programming and the collection that you build. You know, I think I know the answer to this question, but were you hired as a trans educator? I was. um, I um, do not. My legal name um, currently does not align with like my 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 name. So, um, you know, as as I was being hired, I um, was up front. I introduced, you know, I was like, I'm G. I use them pronouns. Um, I'm trans. I was out at at all points because um, I wanted from the get-go to be referred to with the name and pronouns that um, I would like, even though um, my um, gender and my name, my legal name um, are different. And so um, I didn't want, you know, there to be um, even more (laughs) opportunities um, for misgendering um, or dead naming. And so I, I was out um, and I even like, I put my pronouns on like my resume uh, because that was something that I felt, felt comfortable doing. Um, But I know that not everybody um, has the capacity to do that. So, um, and when I, when I was hired, I made sure um, to say like, Hey, um, I want to make sure that my preferred name is like shows up on everything that it can. I understand like for timesheets, et cetera, that it needs to have my legal name, but all other documents and like my email, uh, my email address, my email display name, that that shows my, um, my preferred name and not my legal name. 
Um, and they they were very accommodating. There was a little bit in the beginning, like it took a little bit for it to, to roll over, but, um, but I was very fortunate in that it was only a little bit of bureaucracy um, to navigate, but um, but yeah, it's it's difficult when your um, legal name does not align with your actual name. Um, to there's a lot of bureaucracy to navigate, um, but for the most part, my privacy has has been protected. Um, and like for example, if there's a document that has to have my legal name on it, they'll put a sticky note over it or they'll put it in an envelope and put it in my mailbox so it's not potentially um, disclosing um, confidential information to other employees. I am aware that for HR departments, this is a veritable minefield. Um, and, and, and as my friend wa- and I were both being onboarded at the same time, uh, and similarly, th- there's not a, a legal change to the name yet, so that unfortunately, the dead name kept on popping up. And, and it was hurtful, and it was upsetting, and it really was a disruption to their ability to do their job and not have to also deal with the unwelcome uh, issue of, of, of trying to focus on what you're doing in the moment and then having to deal with HR and, and issues of, of how you would be regarded from the HR's perspective. And, and unfortunately, if there isn't an opportunity for them to be educated, they're sort of making those mistakes as they learn. And it's not a pleasant thing to watch. It was very hurtful for me to watch my friend have to navigate these these uh, treacherous waters and when that was a, a non-issue for me. And we both came to the district at the same time and it was very hard for me to see anybody feel that struggle when it was so unnecessary. Exactly. And if you're encountering people who are openly hostile in, in the process as well, um, that, I mean, it, it takes a toll. We already you know, there's so many demands on our time already. And then to have to navigate all of this in addition to that, it takes, you know, a toll on your mental health and a toll on your time as well. And, you know, you have to be, you know, you basically become a, a semi-legal expert to make sure that, you know, your, your rights are not uh, being violated. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a, a you know, barriers, and it sounds like your administrator is an absolute champion. Yes. No, I, uh, she has been super supportive. She's um, even had conversations. Um, unfortunately, um, I do have some staff members who, even though um, it's been multiple years, um, still do not refer to me uh, with my name and pronouns. And she has had those conversations um, for me, I mean, I've had the conversation with myself and then, um, I've gone to her as well and said, Hey, this is happening. And so, um, she definitely has been, um, very supportive and has, has the hard conversations when, uh, people are not gendering me appropriately and not using, um, my proper honorifics. I use the honorific mix, um, MX, um, uh, instead of Mr. or Miss or teacher, um, and so she uh, has definitely been um, a very solid, um, very solid advocate for me through for students, for staff. Yeah. That was my next question. I, I appreciate that teachers, especially when they're old like me, sometimes have a hard time learning new things. Students are generally cool with just being like whatever. And I, I know it's not unusual. I, I hear from students all the time who have said, actually, I know that this is what, you know, when I, this is on my, my student ID, but you know, Miss, I, Mr. Ma, I just want you to call me this. I'm like, no problem. We got it. Okay. Have you had, I mean, have there been any conversations with students who are like, I don't get it? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, um, that has definitely happened to me um, a few times. They're like, well, what are you? 
And I'm like, okay, well, I'm non-binary and that's, you know, and they're like, well, what is that? And I'm like, okay, well, non-binary is a term that you can use for, and there are some people who are boys, there are some people who are girls, and there are some people who are both or neither. I'm non-binary and that's a word that means someone who isn't a boy or a girl. And sometimes they're like, oh, okay. And sometimes they're like, I don't get it. And I'm like, and, and I was like, okay, well, you don't have to understand it completely to know that my name is Mixed T and when you talk about me, you use they um, instead of he or she. And they're usually like, okay. Um, most students, I've had some instances of homophobia and transphobia from students, but you know, it's, it's hard because you see, you know, they're talking and I, when they're talking, I can see the parent behind them, you know, saying, repeat you know they're just repeating what they have heard because you know it's it's learn it's a learned behavior and either you know they hear from home or they see it online um so i always i definitely have a huge ethic of care um i'm and in like my librarianship work and i um, spent a lot of time de-escalating and debunking. Uh, I've spent many a lunchtime debunking conspiracy theories um, with students and taking, because um, I want them to feel like I take what they say seriously um, and I don't just, oh, we're not going to talk about that or no. Because um, I'll sit and interrogate and be like, okay, when you say this, this is the history that you're calling up. Is this something you knew or, you know, um, where did you hear this? And so um, I, I feel for me, um, I feel like that is a good use of, of my time to sit and have, have those conversations. Um, and so I do. And sometimes kids are like, yeah, I still don't get it. Or they're like, yeah, I don't believe that. And I'm like, that's, that's fine. This is how you need to refer to me in order to be respectful. And they, they usually can all get behind that. And some of them also take great delight in correcting their teachers when their teachers, <laughs> um, mess up either on purpose <laughs> either you know on accident or for for other reasons i have many a student who um sometimes takes a little extra joy <laughs> in being an advocate for me <laughs> Well, and, and if there's one thing our students are good at is being excited when they know something. Yes. Um, it's, it's very, it's valuable. It's, it's a commodity. They, it's something they feel they can share and own. And, and in that respect, you have the opportunity to have this amazing, wonderful impact on students who, you're right, in many cases, the, the environment they're growing up in, this is very new for, for some families your opportunity to make that kind of impact on every student in your building. I noticed for a couple of times I've had to, to be that, that cheerleader for my friend when we have guest teachers. We have substitute teachers in the building. Uh, and, and I'm not sure if this happens in your building, but we've got a high turnover of people who will come as guest teachers. And all of a sudden, I, I will be correcting them. And, and as the person who will, who will roll, I will, will model the, 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 the correct terms and, and make sure that pronouns are being respected. And, and it is interesting because every once in a while they're like, well, I can ask the librarian because in this case it's me. And they're like, well, and I'm like, look, I, you know, this is not about your comfort. This is about respecting that, you know, this teacher and, and their, their authentic self. So how about we just go with, and, and I, you know, insert name and there we go. And yep, I'm just another, I'm just a cheerleader. No, I think that's, that's so needed though. Cause like, I mean, we, we can't be everywhere we're, and sometimes we're not even in the room where the, when those conversations are happening. And so I think that it's so impactful to, to model that. And I really try and do that, especially when students are present to model, model the corrections, um, because it's important for them to see one, if there's a student in the room that they see like, okay, this is how I stick up for myself, or this is how I stick up for others, or, Hey, this, this is a mistake that somebody made. And when this mistake happens, it's appropriate to address the mistake and then move on. And I think that that modeling that, especially for young people and for the, for the adults that are also in our spaces is really crucial because it's impactful for everybody in, in that space to see what is acceptable, what's not, how do we address this? And then how do we go forward? 
Ah, so important. So important. You know, let's, let's, uh, offer some advice to listeners who are members of the trans community and would like their hiring process to go as smoothly as possible. (laughs) What, as, as someone who has been there, done that, Mm -hmm. got the t-shirt, what advice would you give to somebody, uh, a member of the trans community? I'm thinking about people in my sort of circle who have come out as trans, but in much later in life. So old like me, And if you can imagine that kind of life where you are living one existence and yet there is, there is something inside you that says, this isn't, this isn't who I really am, but our, our coming out as trans is much later and then going in and getting that next job. So what advice would you give to somebody who is looking to get hired similarly to you? And this is uncharted territory for them. Yeah. Um, so, and of course, you know, your mileage may vary. Um, I can't, you know, I don't represent um, all trans experiences. I can give, you know, some tips, but you know, you have to do what is safest for for you. Um, so um, I would say there's a, a few things like if you have, if you've already got all of your documents changed, then it's up to you whether or not you want to be stealth um, and um, if that is a, a new term um, for listeners, um, stealth is when you do not disclose your identity um, as trans. Um, so if you have everything, um, if, you know, if you have all of your name change paperwork in order and you can be stealth and you would prefer that for your safety, 100% totally fine, totally valid. If you want to be out as trans, I would say wait until after you ha- have the offer letter because, you know, there's all they'll find a way if they don't want to hire you because you're trans they'll find a way to get around the fact that they legally cannot do that Um, so i would say um a good rule of thumb wait until you have the offer letter Um, if you plan on um plan on disclosing disclose after the offer letter um and i think heading off potential quote-unquote mistakes um so you know um making sure okay there's a a written letter that says okay that my credential has this name my degree has this name this is evidence of you know this is evidence here's my name change paperwork or um you know my legal name does not reflect my current name my current name is this please use my current name on all um all interpersonal communication all staff communication everything except for my timesheet and any other legal um, legal notices, such as health insurance, um, for example. Um, setting up um, a meeting with HR. Um, I was able to do it at my onboarding. Um, talking with your principal um, as well, making sure, um, you know, especially if they're writing um, an introduction um, about you, if they're, you know, meeting you for the first time, if they're introducing you to other people. Um, deciding, um, you know, trying to get ahead of potential for um, for misgendering and for and for dead naming, um, setting up those meetings in advance, I think, is crucial. And waiting until you have the actual offer letter um, to disclose if that's something you are choosing to do and be out. Um, I would also say um, decide for yourself what boundaries you are willing to set when it comes to questions about your identity, uh, because. Um, yeah, you know, there'll be questions, um, especially from, from young people. Um, and it depends on the grade, um, as well. I've worked, um, in K-12 settings and, um, how I, what I say and how I say it differs, you know, obviously based on, um, the age of, of the students and, um, you know, the, the complexity of, of the discussion and the complexity of the questions um, changes as well. So um, I set a very firm boundary for myself. I do not disclose my birth gender. Um, I do not disclose my birth name to students or staff. Um, and then, and I obviously don't answer questions about my body, um, although they are asked a lot. Um, and so I set very firm, firm boundaries. Um, I don't talk about what pronouns I used to go by. Um, and that's something for, for me that, um, I choose not to disclose and you have to decide what is comfortable for you. If you're going to be, 
um, out as trans, you know, decide what questions you are comfortable answering, um, what questions you aren't, and some stock phrases for when you don't feel comfortable and um, for when you do. Because um, for me, it's helpful to like kind of like rehearse, I guess, um, some, some things to say just because um, sometimes, you know, a question can get you off, caught off guard or you're trying to teach a lesson and someone raises their hand and they say, well, are you a boy or a girl? And you're like, well, right now we're talking about algorithm bias. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe there's a way to weave that into the conversation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or maybe there isn't. Uh, <laughs> well, and I, I think that they make a big deal of it if you make a big deal out of it. And oftentimes it is not unusual, regardless of the age of our students, they're sometimes looking for that shock value and you just can't let them get you. <laughs> they just, nope, don't let them get to you. What advice would you give to cisgender listeners who would like to be supportive of our trans coworkers? Um, I think this is um, really excellent and really needed right now, honestly. Um, just because of, of all of the violence, of all of the um, vitriol, the hate, the misinformation um, that is spreading. Um, I think, one, just like being there emotionally for us right now, um, because it is a, a really challenging time. Um, I think being active, talking with um, folks about what they feel comfortable with um, in terms of when somebody you know misgenders them um, or uses the the wrong name um, so that way because you know it it can be exhausting to have those conversations over and over again and so i would say um, you know figuring out what um, what your coworker is comfortable with and then advocating if you hear the wrong name um, you know call it out either you know just by rephrasing and then using um, the correct name and pronouns by saying, oh, actually, um, you know, so-and-so uses these pronouns or so-and-so uses this name. Um, those addressing um, the microaggressions when they happen, um, especially to other staff, to other students, having kind of a, a basic trans literacy. I think that that is really helpful, especially um, with, when it comes to serving students as well, there's core terms that um, I think as librarians we should know in order to help meet trans students' information needs and also to be supportive of our trans coworkers as well. Having, um, you know, just, you don't have to be, you know, don't go, you don't have to go to your master's in gender and sexuality, but at least knowing <laughs> kind of the, I mean, you can if you want to, um, but having a basic knowledge of um, the terminology of kind of current events, the Translash, Translash podcast by Imara Jones um, is a great place to um, hear from trans uh, journalists, kind of what is happening in the world. They're doing a deep dive right now on transphobia in the United States specifically uh, that I think is really good. Uh, Imara is a fantastic journalist. Um, and so um, I think, you know, kind of being up to date, speaking out um, and where you can, because um, I know for, for some people, um, depending on where you live, it can be easier or more difficult to have these conversations and um, sticking up and speaking out um, for others, um, especially when it's hard, especially when it's uncomfortable, uh, because you'll, you'll likely hope, uh, the hope is that, you know, there, there's power in numbers, there's power in solidarity, um, and you don't want to leave um, the person who is already being marginalized further alone. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's, the, the, the list goes, goes on and on, but I think that that, you know, it comes down to being there to advocate for them, speaking out when something is wrong, being there physically, like as a, as a support. Um, if, you know, they don't want to have a conversation alone, um, if they need somebody to help, you know, support them or to have a parent conversation, um, for example, uh, to have, to, to be there with them in that support because navigating parent conversations is, is a whole other dynamic and um, knowing how your rights are protected uh, and and how they unfortunately are not uh, that can also help as well and I think that um, you know to 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 make 
an impact, especially right now um, when so many aspects of transition or transition related care, uh, those rights are being stripped away, making sure that like they, they know that you have their back. Um, and um, yeah, it, I don't know, it's, it's really scary right now um, because so many aspects of, of transition are, are being heavily criminalized. You know, there's several bills um, in a variety of different states here in the United States that would make it illegal to have access to transition-related care or, you know, there's lists of people who have changed um, their names. So if somebody decides, for example, to go stealth um, and to say, I'm not disclosing um, my status um, as a transgender person, that um, you are there in support um, in support of that. Because um, for yeah, that might be the safest thing for, for somebody to do. And so it's something that, you know, just perspective, yeah. my coworker, um, we're in the same hiring class. And one of the first things we did is we became friends who text. And for me, um, that is, uh, if you want to send out a, a, you know, a, a, a life preserver, you want to send out the ultimate of I'm here and I'm going to be able to help you, you know, become a friend who texts because then you can have that back channel. It's off of the, it's, it's off of the school email. It is completely discreet and, and checking in often, uh, as the work, I'm, I'm sort of the, the work mom in my building because I am, uh, I, this is my 31st year in education. Um, you know, I, I, I get to be work mom and in doing so, it, it gives me the perfect excuse to check in on people. And and because we we text, it's a way to just make sure that everybody is feeling supported um, as we we sort of navigate navigate through these first year for few years that we are being hired and and being together. You know, I I wanted this is a great time to mention that G has been so generous in sharing some amazing resources. And I'll tell you what, every time we educate ourselves on as you were saying terminology and how to be an advocate, how to be an ally. We're going to be not only supporting our, our fellow educators, but our students as well. We say, oh, my library is a safe space for all our students. I'm like, oh, the school should be a safe space for our students. It, this should be when you walk in the door, this should be where, where students can absolutely feel like they can be themselves without repercussion all of the the conversations all the changes that you can make to policies and procedures um, they will support a variety of different students which is you know um you know um we're not you know, like as the, the quote says we're not free until we're all free um, because our liberation is bound up in each other and so when um you know we support our most marginalized students we are supporting all all of our students and we are helping to make sure that there is a more just future. Um, something um, additional that we can do, um, especially as staff, is to advocate for things like professional development or when we're seeing um, injustices that are present, um, especially if um, you are um, cisgender and you would like to, to, to be supportive, bringing them up to admin, having those conversations or, you know, oh, I heard, you know, this teacher say something and, you know, I think that as their direct supervisor, it would be helpful if you had this conversation with them about, you know, accepting and respecting our students, um, something, you know, to, to these effects. Um, and I think, um, also being aware of how, um, gender identity and sexuality intersect, um, with race, um, and with racism as well, I think that that um, is really paramount because, um, unfortunately, um, trans um, students are really likely to experience victimization in schools and the numbers jump even higher if they are trans students of color because in addition to the transphobia, they're also um, encountering racism as well. And um, unfortunately, that is likely coming from students and from staff. And so they're navigating um, those intersections as well. And so students deserve to see the wholeness of their identity uh, respected, accepted, and uplifted. I'm hoping you can help me and other cisgender listeners because 
in many cases, we want to be allies and we are ill-equipped or we're misinformed. What can we insist our districts do and our buildings do to create a more supportive environment for our trans employees? For sure. I think, um, and some of this, you know, will depend on the specific state, but um, if you're in a position to inquire about health care, making sure that transition-related care is covered under our health insurance, that's a really big one, um, especially now when um, so much access to transition-related care um, is being attacked, um, is under heavier scrutiny, and is even being outright banned. So I think that's something that um, folks can can push for, especially, um, you know, if they're in a district level position or know folks who are, um, or maybe are involved with um, their unions, those are great things um, to look at. Another one is advocating for professional development that um, is led by trans people on how to make a workplace more trans inclusive. There's plenty of different organizations out there, both nationally and locally, um, that are um, doing the work and that are invested. And that way, um, we're prioritizing um, trans knowledge and experiences. And so those tip types of trainings could cover things like microaggressions, forming gender support plans um, for students, but also um, developing procedures for, for staff as well so that um, our HR departments, our principals all know um, how to make sure that our privacy is protected and respected um, and that when we go into our workplaces, we are less likely to be misgendered um, and have personal information or private information um, or, or even our status as transgender uh, be uh, revealed to others without our consent. Um, bathrooms are another one, you know, making sure that there are um, gender neutral bathrooms, making sure that folks are able to safely use the bathrooms that they identify, pushing for um, principals to have conversations with other staff members who are not referring um, to our colleagues in an appropriate way, kind of being being that squeaky wheel because um, for trans folks and for other folks with marginalized identities, um, the cost of speaking up, um, especially when it's about your own identity, um, is often much greater. Um, and that may be, be visible and that may uh, be invisible um, to an outside observer. So something that um, someone who is really trying um, to be an effective um, ally and advocate for um, their trans coworkers would be to, to speak up, to have those difficult um, or potentially uncomfortable conversations where you know you're putting yourself out there, you are advocating um, for something, especially if um, the folks who are higher up are not vocally supportive. Being that advocate, and, you know, letting letting um, your coworkers know, hey, I've got your back. Like this is a hard conversation. Let me, uh, you know be the first one to speak out, let me go with you, let me um, be a support, I'll talk to that person who keeps misgendering you, I'll talk to the principal, um, all, the, all of these different types um, of things I think would be helpful. And you know, of course that, that isn't everything, but um, that's definitely a start and a way to kind of provide material, tangible uh, support in the moment. Well, and I, th I know there's strength in numbers, but when you're a, a, a team of one, when there is one transgender employee in your mm -hmm. building, all of a sudden your team is going to be the allies who who recognize the, like you were saying, some of these microaggressions, some of these overt aggressions, uh, making sure that you are not standing alone and, and rallying, even if it is an ally like, like me, <laughs> uh, we want to make sure that whenever our district is doing the right thing by making sure that our our staffing is as diverse and inclusive as we possibly can be because in that way our students I know our students who are trans are are drawn in many ways to our trans employee and see a a future the it gets better and and that navigating high school is is going to be worth it because as a trans adult who can be working in our school as a teacher it is so affirming in their own journey. Yeah, I've definitely been fortunate to be a part of those conversations um, with uh, students at my middle school. And it's been just like so amazing and rewarding to see like their eyes light up and in, they'll ask me, you know, like, 
all of these questions about my life and my experiences and just kind of seeing the, the possibilities of existence and, you know, like, does it get better in high school? Does it, you know, get worse? What, what about after? When do you know? What do you do? Um, and I think um, it's so, so important to be able to provide that, that positive role model. And even I've had some unfortunate instances with some students who, who are homophobic, um, and who are transphobic and have kind of said some of these things to me, but, um, at the same time, they are coming, you know, that's something that they are repeating from somewhere. Um, and so my goal is also to be a positive force in that student's life to kind of chip away at that conditioning for them to say, oh, I thought my world was like this because that's what I've heard, but here's somebody in my life that is disrupting that. And I think that is also powerful. If you have never, like, if you're, you're kind of just uh, this, this mythical idea of, of a group of people, um, but you haven't, like, I, I don't know, it kind of ties into like media literacy for a little bit, because if you see this, like, you know, invisible group of, of people, um, and you have no actual connection, no, um, no experiences, nothing besides what you have heard at home, what you have seen online. Uh, there's, it becomes very hard to debunk that worldview. And when you're exposed to, to media or ideas that, that debunk that worldview, it will take longer and longer the more you are entrenched in that and an, an um an unfortunate position um for trans people and people folks with other marginalized identities is that that unlearning sometimes is happening in uh, in the classroom in the library in real time and unfortunately sometimes we become targets of of that student when um when we sh when we shouldn't be um and it's important for students to unlearn that but i think that's where that advocacy from allies comes in because it can be very um it can be painful it can be a lot um like i recently just had a student make um a joke and i'm using air quotes here because it's not a joke um about identifying um as a truck which unfortunately is um, a parody of the phrase I identify as an attack helicopter, which um, circles repeatedly on alt-right um, transphobic, you know, message boards, etc. online communities. And it um, is very hard to have that, that conversation knowing that, that inflammatory history. And that's something that I think that allies can help with because they can step in and they can have that conversation with the student. And sometimes too, um, depending on um, the response, you could be seen as pushing an agenda, especially right now. I, you know, there are plenty of uh, cisgender librarians who are called groomers, you know, who are said, oh, you're peddling an agenda, you're peddling pornography, all of these, all of these things. And then uh, when you have a marginalized identity in this instance being trans that also gets lumped in with it because there is a huge history of uh, being called groomers uh, being called pedophiles you know we had the briggs initiative in california which specifically looked to fire queer teachers on the grounds that on the false sorry on the false grounds um, that they were all pedophiles so it is an unfortunately long um, long history, especially um, in education. Well, and I, I think that this is where those allies come in, come into play because we're all over the building. And I, I you know, I, I know that every administrator out there wants to make sure that that teachers are visible during passing, that mm -hmm. uh, the students become very loose with their ideas and language and loud yes. <laughs> during passing. And and when they're moving, they they assume that that it doesn't no one what they say is not going to somehow be heard or resonate with anybody and and the more present allies can be in the in the hallways during during the the passing time i have recognized that not only do the conversations all of a sudden stop when they see me that if i hear something i'm calling them out mm -hmm. and i'm going to do so in a way as what do you mean by that wow you know i i 
you know, explain to me what you meant because I heard that and I think I, I would like to know what you meant by that because what what I think you just said was very hurtful. And and I, I, I think that it is something that I've had to do on certain certain occasions uh, when I hear certain words that are used to reference students in in when especially when they're in my earshot. And uh, and so, no, I, I think that there this is a process that is going to take time. And every time you sort of chip away, like you say, at, at those those stereotypes that that students are are holding on to because those images are so ingrained in the culture and the and the home life um this is it's a process it's just going to have to take time and thankfully as their librarians we're working with them day in and day out for as long as they're students in that building exactly and um there's another dimension too unfortunately which is staff there are some staff who are also coming in, um, as I'm sure that um, you and your coworker have experienced as well. There's plenty of staff that are coming in with much longer and much more firmly entrenched um, held belief systems and deconstructing those, or even just saying like, you know what, you like think whatever you want, but you have to like refer to this person in this way because that is what that, that is the base level of respect that they deserve. Um, those conversations are also super crucial. In addition to the fantastic resources you've shared, you, you've included the, the Human Rights Campaign, which has authored resources, including the Gender Support Checklist for Transgender and Non-Binary Students. And this is very comprehensive. And it makes me realize how easy it is to miss something if you aren't paying attention to how we are integrating and supporting our, our trans students in our, when it comes to having them registered as students into our school and all the different types of supports, which we need to sort of suss out in order to make sure that they're, uh, that they are comfortable, not just with the the name and the pronouns, but also in talk, talking about things like locker rooms and restrooms, and um, you know, and even another issue is to the extent to which there is family support behind the student in in this, because oftentimes it has been my experience where students are extremely comfortable at, at school. School is not the problem. It's home. And so I think it is something um, and to be aware of. And I think um, it's not, you know, we talk about, oh, it's just, it's, it's one more thing. It's another thing. But um, this is so crucial to a student's sense of belonging and safety that this needs to be integrated into our approach. For example, if your catalog has a preferred name field, um, but you're sending home notices of what books a student has checked out and their name, um, that could potentially create a very unsafe um, home um, environment for that student. And so it's crucial to make sure that we are respecting their privacy, that we're looking to see all the different ways that we can support a student and having resources that are available for them, making sure, you know, what we're, what um, information we're sending home, what um, information that parents have access to. Um, for, for, for us, um, we do have a preferred name field, but um, because we use Destiny and it syncs with our power school. So if I change the preferred name field, Unless it's changed in power school, it just gets overwritten like at five o'clock every day. So being aware of how um, the technology that we use interfaces um, and how that protects um, or un unintentionally violates our students' privacy, uh, that is all really crucial. What um, is in our catalog, the types of um, the types of resources, are we providing um, transition-related resources? There's plenty of um, content that gets caught up in our school's filters. For example, the um, YouTube channel Queer Kid Stuff, that is a, a lovely, um, completely elementary age appropriate YouTube channel, but depending on the type of filter that your district uses, it could get caught up um, if they're using any different type of, of keyword. Um, the um, Sylvia Rivera Law Project, for example, if they use the word sex when it 
you know, talking about the legal definition of sex, that could get caught in your filter because of the word sex. And so um, thinking about, you know, all of these different things um, all can help our students access information or prohibit or inhibit them from accessing information. There's a, a wide a wide range of things to consider um, but it's it's important because you know we're we're already um, having conversations about protecting privacy and about having access to information and resources and this is just another avenue um, to address that well and i'm glad you mentioned the the issue with the the notices that are going home because i i know when we use destiny you can indicate how many different emails and i i i know uh i don't know do your middle school students have email they have school emails they do not. i wish okay. they did because that would make yeah. it a lot easier but they don't yeah. <laughs> so i yeah i know because at the high school level i know we can indicate you know how many emails this is going out to and and there's room for you know uh parent email parent email student email and if it's going out to the parents, the parents are finding out what the kids have checked out and that's a violation of their privacy. And so, you know, and obviously the workaround is to, you know, paper, you know, printouts, giving them, giving them to the kids during homeroom. That's, that's probably a pretty, pretty typical, uh, workaround. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I will say one of the, the issues that we were running into with students, especially who are, um, obviously have not change their names, but have a name that they would like us to use. This is, these are my pronouns. This is the name I use. And I'm like, Hey, that's cool. We can put a, a nickname into uh, our, our student management system that we use. And, um, but as I understand that, that has to be initiated through the parents. I think it depends on your state because um, in in California, um, our students have the right to self-identify without parent consent, um, so they can change um, they can change their name um, on all non-legal um, school documents, and they do not have to have parent permission. They can have um, we have uh, in my district we have a gender support plan um, for students that navigates like locker room access or any you know, any any um, like sex segregation facility, kind of how they navigate that, um, because um, in California our students do have the right to be themselves um, at school without um, parental consent because specifically um, of the potential ramifications if that student does not have a supportive um, home environment. But that is not the case in many, many, many other places. So, you know, if you're doing what, what you can, I'd say it's really important to know what what exactly the laws are and how you can work uh, to make sure that your students have access to materials. And I think it's really important, especially if like these materials are being banned and censored right now, we know that our students need that access. And so I think there's, again, there's choices that we have to make, especially if we are in places um, where uh, where books about um, trans content are being censored, there is a choice that you know I can't. I'm not in that situation. I can't tell you. You know, I'm. I. It's not fair of me to sit here and say risk your job, um, but to adequately meet our students' information needs and to get students life saving resources because. These, these resources are life-saving. Students who have a safe space at school, um, who have access to these resources, are much, much more likely to make it to their 18th birthday than students who do not. And so there's a, there's a, you know, you have to decide what is safest for you and for your students to do when it comes to information access and what materials um, you are able to provide for your students. Well, all I know is California is sounding better and better. Uh, the more, <laughs> the more I learn about California, and uh, don't get me wrong, Michigan's we're doing we're doing well. Uh, we're yes. doing we're doing very well. California is prioritizing our students' well-being above whatever community 
issues might come up in at a board meeting, say, for example. You know, and unfortunately, the, the, the Moms for Liberty have managed to make armchair activists out of so many people who uh, spend any considerable amount of time on Facebook. They just feel some, somehow some indignation and they can go march in and, and demand to have books taken off the shelves because, uh, th- yes, of the, of the content. So, no, I'm, I'm so grateful that you're here today. You know, I, we've talked about how incredibly supportive your administration is, and I will I will just say myself, um, when I was hired uh, two years ago, uh, the thing I noticed right away in the uh, email signatures from my administrators on the hiring team all had pronouns in their in their email signatures. I, I think that the messaging that comes from that top down about not only obviously staffing decisions, yes. But also the standardization, making it absolutely just uh, expected that everybody would put their pronouns in their in their email signatures. Um, all, a lot of us wear uh, pronoun pins, uh, which is that opportunity to invite uh, students. To, I know I, I, I teach high school students, and 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 they have uh, oftentimes offered to me um, because I, I sort of broadcast that on my lanyard, uh, my pronouns, and it, it is an opportunity for us to talk about uh, what what is in the best interest of our students. Yeah. Uh, and I, I will say, um, for in terms of like my, my district um, and in that supportive environment, I am very grateful for it. But that's not to say that California is like this complete safe haven, because there are many districts. I was just talking with some folks at the California School Library Association conference um, about this. There are many districts that are in the middle of some very horrific um, homophobic and transphobic book challenges who have, uh, you know, very stacked uh, school boards who have um, administration that is not supportive um, at all. And so while the, there are these these um, technical legal protections in place at, at, in our ed code and at the higher levels, that doesn't always translate um, to to a supportive district. And but like you said, administration, that's that's who sets the tone um, and that's who really has to do the work um, because change, uh, unfortunately, especially at a school site, um, change is not going to come unless it comes from the top down. It's very hard to fire a credential teacher, right? Um, it's very hard to fire someone who has tenure, even if that person is making the environment unsafe. And so having that supportive administration is crucial. Um, and the, the pronoun thing is interesting. Um, and obviously our community is not a monolith. And so people will feel different types of way about this. But I have very mixed feelings about making pronouns and email signatures compulsory because that could force somebody to out themselves or if somebody is questioning their pronouns um, or somebody who has already transitioned um, and who is well along in their social transition, in their physical transition, and then for somebody to come up and say, oh, well, what are your pronouns? It can feel, it can bring back that dysphoria and it can feel feel very disrespectful. And so for, for me personally, I think that um, including pro- pronouns is great, but I think when it becomes compulsory, it could, like, there is a, a possibility that um, trans people could um, could be harmed um, in a in a variety of different ways. They could be forced to out themselves, or they could be forced to uh, misgender themselves if they are not um, able to to be out in their workplace. And so, I think that that's definitely a consideration. I think it can show um, it can show that like openness and respect and awareness. But if it's not backed by actions that are supportive. Like if somebody has their pronouns in their email signature, but they don't gender me correctly ever, then then it's kind of just like signal, you know, it's just like, you're doing it for like brownie points. <laughs> um, oh, no, we call that yeah. virtue signaling. Yes. Vir- yes. Virtue, signal. it's virtue, virtue signaling. signaling. And, and I, I do, I do it. I'm shameless about my virtue signaling. I, I think part of it is because it is whether I'm advocating for my uh, library 
um, where I, I, I will, I am shameless about my virtue signaling. I've, I, I wear my, my biker jacket with my library, uh, patches on it. And, and I, I, I'm not quiet about anything. So when it comes to book banning, I'm not going to be quiet about it. And it's, I, I, I'm so accustomed to being loud and, and I think we all, especially when we feel so passionately about something as important as our space, as, as our, our role as a librarian, uh, but also being that ally. And I, I think I have embraced ally as, as part of, of who I am, uh, for personal reasons, uh, for, for my emotional investment I have in the people I love who are, who are, uh, who are LGBTQIA. And, and I also feel that I would want to make sure that when I think about the people in my life who are, are, are living their best lives, I want to make sure that they know that, that me as their friend, me as their coworker, me as their mom, I'm here for them. And so that's, that's, I, I realize that it may be broadcasting something but it's authentic. Yeah, no, no, no. And I, think I, <laughs> I, yeah. I do feel passionately about it. And I, I do not, I, I don't uh, want to cheapen whatever I do because I have things that I, that are important to and me. And I, I don't, I don't think it does. I think what, what I was um, trying to say is like, if, if something like that is, is compulsory, I think it could, there are, there are these like unseen problems. And if it's not, backed backed by action you know if it's just if it's there to look good but you're not doing the the, the work because obviously there are people who are there who who are who are doing the work and you can um th- that it is backed by action and i think that that is really impactful especially for for young people to see um see that advocacy and almost sometimes you have to be super blatant um about it because that's what students are going to notice and that's what they're going to gravitate towards and appreciate and so i think my original comment was more like if you know you are like and not not you like you personally but like you know (laughs) the broader you like um you know you got to be um willing to to back it up it's not enough to just put your pronouns and you have to also be be that advocate like you said you have to be loud um because other otherwise then it's it's not actually helpful it's just looking like you're supported without actually providing the support so that they they go hand hand in hand that that visible that visibility has to be accompanied by by that tangible support like you were saying about being loud about being an advocate see friends this is like when i said when you when you know better you do better right thank you talk about the space that we occupy um, in our libraries, our learning commons, as, as somebody who wants to, to build this inclusive space for, for all of your students, can you share with us at all, what have you done to, to create that, that atmosphere, that, that chemistry or that, that, that vibe in your space? What have you done? Um, I have, um, multiple flags. Um, that's, that's one thing I have. I have the non-binary flag, which a student actually got for me, um, which many students think is the Raiders flag. (laughs) Surprising. Um, but I have, I have a lot of flags. I have a lot of posters, um, up around, um, the library, um, with a bunch of different, um, like slogans. I, um, there's some really cool posters from um, this organization called Forward Together. Um, I use some of their art. Some of their art is is definitely um, for like an older or like more adult audience because they make art for a variety of different social issues. Um, but there are some really great ones that that work for um, high school, middle school, elementary school, and positive messages. So I have public signs and I know that not everybody's in a position to do this um what I what I've done and what I can do in my space like I have signs that say Black Lives Matter um Si Se Puede I've got lots of different I've got different flags I've got um different you know little posters that I keep up um one specifically about like indigenous land and sovereignty um any display um that I do I make sure to include people um from a variety of different um, experiences and perspectives. So in my romance 
display, I made sure that most of the the characters um, that were represented on the on the front covers and most of the authors who I was featuring um, were not. Um, white, straight, and cis. Um, and that also comes with, with collection development. Um, I've yeah, done, done a lot of, of weeding and um, making sure that, the, that you show um, a variety of people, especially because there's so many different intersections with our identities. So if I do, like, you know, for example, if I do a Pride Month display, I'm making sure that it's not just all, like, white queer and trans people, <laughs> that there's queer and trans people of color, um, also um, featuring um, disability um, representation as well, um, a variety of different perspectives as well. Um, there's a lot of different, you know, types of um, queer and trans stories, and so making sure even in the content of the book as well that they're getting a variety of different perspectives and experiences. Um, those are things that I try and do and point um, point things out to students as well, connect them um, to resources. I have um, a lanyard that I usually wear that has like my pronouns and some different pins. Um, and I know there are several students that um, said when they first came in to the library, they were like, oh, I saw like your Black Liberation and Indigenous Sovereignty poster and I saw your pronouns and like I knew that you were like gonna be a safe space and those like visible representations combined with also like I spend the time um, addressing every single microaggression that I hear <laughs> and it takes time and it takes away from my original lesson plan but to me that learning that is important like to stop to address what's happening um either like like in the i'll either take the time as a whole class or i'll say hey that's not cool um this is appropriate this is you know not appropriate i'm going to talk to you later um, or have the conversation in the moment i think to me those are so crucial especially at a middle school level um, when some of our students are um, exploring different social media avenues for better or for worse um, or feel inclined to just blurt things out um, i that to me really helps to craft um, a safe space because i have students who come to me and tell me how they feel in classes where that doesn't happen and so i'm like i'm not gonna be that person who the, the student is like, my that teacher won't say anything. And those are teachable moments. I mean, that that's literally our job. We, this is <laughs> this is what we do. And and it is a teachable moment. And but there you're right that there has to be a certain amount of awareness for how is this message going to be received. We don't want to put people in a place where they're going to be shamed. Um and it is like I think because I have an office, it's not unusual for some of those conversations to happen but literally behind a closed door when I'm talking to uh, other adults. Um, I, I had occasion to, we had a guest speaker come in who um, made a, a gendered uh, a assumption about the person sitting next to me and they were very wrong. And I, I waited till everything was over and everybody was wrapping up and I'm like, Hey, can I talk to you for a second? And we just, and, and, and actually they ended up uh, asking for an email so that they could, you know, send a, a, a sincere apology because again, as a, as a presenter, um, maybe Making assumptions about something something like gender is is an absolute sort of deal breaker. You cannot do that if your job is to to be speaking in front of large groups. And so again, when you know better, you do better. You know, I, I love this idea that our collections are are the intentionality uh, with which you're you're going about creating the displays and. Uh, you know, I know, especially for me, the, one of the fun opportunities in building out our collection is our memoir unit, because uh, we have entire entire grades that do memoir units. You've got to make sure you get that representation in the memoir units, too. So 
all of a sudden, in addition to, you know, a lot of a lot of your fiction is is an easy place to, to integrate a lot of our representation into into our collections, but also remembering our nonfiction as well, our, our biographies, our memoirs. You know, I, could you speak a little bit to this idea of genrefication? Because when it comes to our fiction collection, it's not unusual to group our books by genre. And I think there's a, a very real concern that that our students be able to read books without feeling um, judged and and be able to pick up a, a, a title and feel comfortable that they can read this book in peace and, and not have to uh, feel like they're under the watchful eye or scrutiny of, of students or staff. Exactly. And that is why labeling books with an LGBT sticker is not best practice. <laughs> it is not best practice to put them in a section. It is not best practice to put a label on them because it hinders their access to the materials. It's also, it's an identity. It's not really a genre. I know in like adult, you know, fiction, we're kind of seeing like, oh, it's a queer romance. Oh, it's a queer sci-fi. But even still, it's, it's a and it's a descriptor, it's an adjective onto the main genre label. And I think especially when we're curating a collection um, for young people in, in K-12, having them be in other genres and not saying this, this identity in itself is a genre, because even within that, I feel like it's not necessarily accurate because there's so many, the, the primary genre is something like romance, historical fiction, realistic fiction. That's the primary um, genre that if you're, you know, making it, you know, an LGBT book, that's the identity of the main character or the identity of the author sometimes. Um, but even that, you know, we can't, um, we can't always assume that, that that to be the case. So actually having them be, you know, if, if you are genrefying, um, you know, having your realistic fiction section have books with LGBT characters in it, but not having them in their own section. If you want to do like a, you know, queer realistic fiction display, go for it. Um, I think like having a nice rotating, like LGBT display, um, you know, oh, this is like LGBT science fiction. This is like, you know, LGBT romance, um, rotating, those out, I think that that is a great way to provide that access and visibility without, um, you know, bringing potential harm to the student. Because in your library space, you can help facilitate that access to for the student to that material, but you can't control what happens outside of your library. You can't control what happens when that student goes home and their parent sees a book with a rainbow sticker. You cannot control what happens when that that school bully sees them holding that book with a rainbow sticker. What you can do in your space is help that student get access to the book. Having that sticker actually can prevent students and even for a student who might not check it out because of that sticker, maybe they have, you know, their they're young, they're still figuring out their, um, their beliefs, especially, you know, if they're getting strong messaging at home, but putting that book into their hands might be the thing that kind of chips away, uh, at, uh, at a set of harmful ideologies that they've been raised with. And maybe they wouldn't have checked it out, um, because of their home environment or because their preconceived notions, but by having it be, um, in, you know, just, with the rest of the materials, um, that could um, be a great place to build empathy, to build connection, to have that student um, be changed positively from reading reading that uh, reading that book. So I would say um, there's plenty of ways to facilitate access. You could even you know you can make a virtual display as well. Um, and I would even shy away, honestly, I would even shy away from, um, identity based subject headings of main characters because just because, you know, the subject headings are there to categorize the aboutness of an item. Just because the main character, um, has a specific identity does not make the book about that identity. And at the same time, um, we don't see subject headings for identities that are normalized. You don't, where, how often do you see European Americans or um, cisgender people fiction as 
<laughs> as a as a subject heading when you when you're cataloging. Well, now that you now that you mention it, it, it sounds ridiculous. You know, I I think that it's so important though. I you know in in the notes you've you've included these checkouts mm-hmm. and challenges. There are some suggestions because the the concern is that if we have an identifier mm-hmm. in our catalogs, which are online mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. public, that all of a sudden we have given the Moms of Liberty and and all the, 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 the those armchair activists the opportunity to simply find every single book and, and we've done the work for them and, and creating an LGBTQIA label. Uh, I, I think, wouldn't it be fair to say that doing something internally in our space that our students could say, perhaps a, even just a little bookmark, you, there was also that that sort of like flip folder of, of where you can drop in those, if you like this book, then you might like these books. And I, I know, friends, we've seen those on Instagram, but they, they, they have those little standalone ready references. And there's a link to it in the checkouts and challenges resource, which you, you provided for us. It's a catalog rack with index tabs, and then students could get a visual, but it's housed in the library as a physical resource rather than one that the uh, those who are scouring are are opacs to to see what kind of pornography that we are putting out on the shelves uh, for our students. I, I think it's so fantastic because the hypocrisy is such that there is a great deal of of sex on my shelf right now, which in the form of girl and boy fall in love. Nobody has a problem with that. As soon as it involves a boy and a boy and a girl and a girl, all of a sudden, you know, pearls clutched, everyone is, is in a tizzy, and, and it becomes a, a matter that, that only can be solved by, by raising a, a big ruckus at a board of education meeting, because that's not how we get books banned. It's, it's how we, we want to make sure that we make the loudest noise. Yeah. Exactly. I, I definitely think that providing it in, in the space is going, is going to be the safest for students. Obviously, you know, we want to facilitate as much access as we can for students. And at the same time, we cannot ignore the reality um, that we are living in right now, where someone just is looking to go print a laundry list of materials and march it on down um, to their school board meeting. And that's not to say, like, you know, we don't need to change, like, the summary. Um, you know, we don't need to erase the identity from the descriptions of the book, but we do need to be mindful of how we're cataloging the materials and then what we say, um, you know, and what what that says um, about about the materials. And you can also, there are things that you can do depending on your district, you know, you could make it so that you have to sign, there could be single sign-on um, to access your catalog. Um, maybe you have to be on school Wi-Fi to access um, the catalog. There are plenty of, of workarounds and things uh, things that you can do, you can make, you can even make a, a virtual list. Maybe they, they scan the QR code. If, you know, if you're a one-to-one district and every kid has a device, maybe there's um, displays that you can scan. Then you're still providing that digital access um, without also, you know, opening yourself up um, to uh, making it very easy for somebody to uh, just go in and print out a, a giant list that um, was, catalog- was cataloged very nicely for them. <laughs> uh. Well, again, you know, haters are, are out there. It's mm-hmm. what we do to support our students mm-hmm. as best we can every day. And, 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 and also importantly, to make sure that we're supporting all our staff members. to know, you know, when it comes to, uh, do you have any particular favorite lessons or activities that you like to make sure to include in your programming? Yeah, I think it, it depends on um, the age uh, age group, but there's so many different avenues for inclusion. Um, you could, for example, if you're, you know, doing an elementary story time and um, maybe somebody wants to talk about rhyme or, you know, you're in poetry month, um, the book From the Stars in the Sky to the Fish in the Sea by Kai Chung Tom is an amazing book that um, has an excellent use of rhyme and has a non-binary main character. And that is um, a great way to provide that inclusion and celebration of identity without necessarily making it a didactic, like, now we're going to learn about gender identity um, kind of, of moment, which is g- great and wonderful to, to do. Um, and um, it's also nice because it normalizes um, 
different um, identities for students outside of the con outside of a didactic context. Uh, you know, if you are um, doing, I do a um, picture book nonfiction activity for uh, my middle schoolers because typically they think of picture books as quote unquote baby books, even though picture book nonfiction um, can be written, as we all know, um, for a variety of different ages. And so I include a variety of um, different uh, picture book biographies um, of a bunch of different um different people and making sure especially that uh, marginalized voices and experiences of all kinds are represented and so i will include um, for example like uh, sylvia and marcia start a revolution um, i um, if you're talking about things like algorithm bias um, or um, new bias in the news coverage you could look at um, coverage of trans people um, and how trans people are talked about in the media and that um, you know the main focus of um, the lesson is, of course, you know, our library and information science standards, and um, we're bringing in those those critical conversations um, that talk about, uh, you know, uh, trans identity, talk about transphobia, um, and it can give us even, you know, pivotal points to correct um, misinformation and disinformation um, in our students. So those are. Um, a couple, just a, a couple of different, uh, different avenues. And depending on the class that um, is coming in and that you're collaborating with, um, there's even more, uh, there's, there's so much out there. We're really fortunate now. I feel like when I, it wasn't until college where I read, um, a book that described my own experience with gender identity. And it's really cool to see now for my middle schoolers and, you know, granted, it's not, <laughs> it's still not, not great, but there's at least a few different options, um, for my students um with um, more and more um books being published each year and hopefully um we will um continue to have uh more uh more marginalized authors have the platforms to tell the stories that they have the skill to do and um the, you know the desire and wish to and hopefully our um publishing industry will um catch up and support the amazing authors that are out there well, and it goes without saying, but librarians are the ones who create the demand. And so when we do our part to buy those books and create the demand to have books which have trans representation in it, all of a sudden that becomes far more uh, of, of a, a, a a standard of something which which people would consider writing stories about and including in the, in their their storylines. So a lot of this also has to do with the librarians who are then buying those books and and incorporating them into their collections. So I, I think that's so important to keep in mind. And friends, don't worry, we will make sure to include links to some of these titles in the show notes. So that's that's really important. Thank you. You, you mentioned that you, you're excited about the uh, Day of Silence that's coming up. Uh, it, it, there's a nice sort of crossover because as the librarian and you're also a GSA uh, advisor, you get to sort of build all of this programming and, and, and have them overlap. You know, I, I know that you have uh, a, it, that intentionality of building uh, library programs which are going to, to support uh, your entire school community. Uh, you know, do you want to share with us anything else that you have on your horizon? I know we've got Pride coming up, and I don't know if you're still in school in, in, during the month of June. And I know we shouldn't just celebrate uh, our, our LGBTQIA community during June. But do you have anything on your radar that you want to share that you're excited about? Um, we're, we are only in school until, um, until June 2nd. Um, so, and, and like you said, yeah, I do tr like... In all of my displays, I include folks throughout the year, and I think that that's something that's really important that that we should we should not con, you know confine um, books with representation of uh, especially of, of folks with marginalized identities to specific months. They should be integrated um, throughout the year. I am really excited for um, the collaborations with our local archives um, because. Um, that's something that um, we haven't really done a lot. I used to um, volunteer um, and kind of morphed into an internship at this one local um, LGBT archives. So um, I'm excited to get to work with them in, in this capacity. And so our students um, who really don't have that much exposure to LGBT history will now get to experience it through different kinds of art and activities. And we'd like to bring in um, an elder in the community to kind of talk about their own experiences. That's still very much in the planning 
planning phases, um, but that is um, something that um, we would like to like to do in the future. Um, you know, nothing, nothing yet, but um, in working more with um, our local groups, there's a couple local um, LGBT youth groups that we're hoping to get and come speak to the students um, and help, you know, help them get access to um, different resources and materials. So yeah, those are those are definitely things that um, are on the horizon that I'm excited for, um, and getting yeah, getting more students involved. And- you know, I, I'm so grateful you joined the conversation today. I know that there are listeners tuning in who I, I'm just sorry we don't work together because this would be such a wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much for sharing so much of yourself, your experience. And truly, I, I know that I, 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 on behalf of the listeners who are tuning in, I, I appreciate the courage that it takes to to do what you do, to be who you are, and, and to, more importantly, make sure that that those of us tuning in know how to do better for our students and our staff every day. Thank you so much for joining the conversation today. Yes, thank you so much for having me. This is I know it's such a broad topic, and I feel like I'm definitely like left stuff out. And this isn't like the end, the end all, be all. Um, you know, this is just I think the the start of of a conversation, and um, I hope that uh, that yeah we're able to continue it and. Um, talking talking more and doing more um, because I think that especially yeah especially right now with the increase in violence and censorship I think it is it's been necessary and I think it's even more necessary now so thank you for making the space to have a conversation Absolutely. So friends, as I mentioned before, if you have uh, any any pressing questions that you would like to reach out to our guests in the interest of, of protecting their identity, we are not disclosing it on the episode. You are more than welcome to, if you would like to share fan mail, by all means, reach out to the podcast and I will be sure to forward it. If you have questions, I will also share your contact information with our guests and then you can meet a, at a time that is a, you know mutually beneficial on on email but friends i'm so grateful g i i hope you have a fantastic rest of the school year we're sort of into the home stretch and i i hope you have a terrific uh rest of the year thank you amy same to you Friends, I want to thank you for tuning in today, and especially because this is a conversation which is so vitally important that we share it out and and broadcast it around the world. I think so many people can benefit from everything that we have learned from this amazingly courageous and brave school librarian. Do make sure that you spend some time exploring all the show notes which have been so carefully curated and intentionally assembled for today's conversation. If you found this episode helpful, please share it out with your team, your PLN, and on social media. Be sure to follow on your favorite podcatcher so you'll never miss an episode. And if you really like listening today, consider leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Reviews help others find us. One last friendly reminder, I encourage you to take advantage of Capstone's generous $20 discount off an order of $100 or more using the code UNITED. The topic of our next episode will be end of year reports and my conversation with Kelsey Bogan. I hope you will tune in.